Thank you very much, guys. Yes, yeah, so I'm Matt Hayes, and I work at the uh, zoology department in Cambridge, and I've done a lot of work with uh, Andrew over the last few years. Um, I'm also a member of the Insect Ecology uh, Research Group, and uh, currently I'm funded to um, carry out a project that focuses on the insect collections held at the University Museum of Zoology, such as the dragonflies uh, shown here, trying to stay on theme. Um, but more specifically, I'm actually looking at the, the butterfly collections. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about how we can use these historical collections to track changes into the past beyond living memory. But before diving into that, uh, I just wanted to flag the variety of work that is carried out by the Insect Ecology Research Group. So we are interested in studying the importance of invertebrates and aiding their conservation along the way. And we do this in a number of different ways. Um, many members of the group actually work out in the oil palm plantations of Indonesia and Southeast Asia researching the importance of insects and biodiversity within agricultural systems. So in the top left picture, you can see my colleague Millie uh, standing with some plantation workers and other researchers uh, in the center of what is an ant exclusion area. Um, so she, for a PhD, was studying um, the importance of keeping ants uh, around in your, your oil palm plantations. And that's a pretty big feat trying to make these exclusion areas where you remove all the ants from that area and stop them getting in. You basically see what the impacts are. And uh, she basically found that predation of pest species was really important as an important function of the ants. And um, it decreases the herbivory of your, your crop of the oil palm as well. So it, uh, it shows that they're important in these systems. As Andrew has mentioned though, um, other members of the group work closer to home uh, like myself and we research UK butterflies and how we can best manage for them under changing climates. Uh, I've studied the Duke of Burgundy with Andrew in the past in Bedfordshire. That's a butterfly there shown bottom left. And finally, what I'm talking to you about today is that uh, we are really, really lucky to um, share our offices basically with the Zoology Museum in Cambridge. Um, and you can see the big fin whale skeleton in our entrance hall in the top right. Um, and we have access to historical pinned insect specimens for research from the last 200 or so years, which is what I'm going to talk to you about now. So let's have a look at the, the University Museum of Zoology. Um, it's recently undergone a, a five year redevelopment and it opened back up again in June 2018. And we now have these beautiful new shiny galleries, which uh, when it's not a lockdown, you can you can go and see for yourself. Um, but what you might not know is just how much material is stored behind the scenes that isn't actually in the galleries itself. We estimate there's somewhere in the region of maybe six to 7,000 specimens on display in the public galleries. But we also estimate that there's maybe upwards of 2 million specimens actually stored behind the scenes on site in storerooms such as the one that you can see now. So less than 1% of specimens in the museum are actually on display, which I found quite surprising when I, when I started working there. And the vast majority are stored for preservation and also for research, but also physically there's, there's not enough space to put it all on display in the gallery. So when it's not on display, we store it behind the scenes. The largest of these stores is the insect storeroom, again, the one shown here, which is full of cabinets, which are in turn full of these drawers, um, which are then in turn full of rows of pinned insects like the, the large blue butterflies shown on the right here. And um, each one of these specimens also have its, has its own data label. So you can imagine if we've got maybe, well, we think there's probably about a million insects by themselves. That's a million data points of historical information for the last 200 years. So it's, uh, it's a large repository of information. However, the, the insect collection is also the largest main collection at the Zoology Museum yet to be electronically catalogued. So what I mean here is that although we know roughly which specimens we have in the store. So we know that maybe say in 1950s, uh, this individual donated a collection of Lepidoptera. Uh, none of that actual la specific label information is easily accessible on a database for anyone to see. So researchers currently would have to physically visit the collection, um, take out the insect on the pin and read the label to see what information is there, or we would have to do a loan and send it to them and that risks damage to the specimens as well. And this is where my project, um, which I'm currently working on and my funder comes in. Um, so I'm funded by the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund, which is written here, supports projects that increase access to underutilized museum collections. 
and use these collections to achieve social impact. So all awarded funding is specifically tied to a designated uh, museum collection. And in my case, it's the UK Butterfly Collection at the University Museum of Zoology. We've got another picture of some, some large copper butterflies here from the collection. The project has three main goals. Um, so we want to catalog the museum collection, undergo public engagement and aid modern wildlife conservation. And this, this is how we are basically trying to achieve that social impact that uh, the, the funders Esme Fairburn requests from getting this funding for this project. So the first um, aim, which underpins the other two, as I said, is cataloging and digitizing the UK butterfly collection. So like you can see the swallowtail butterfly on the top right. It would be great to catalog the whole insect collection, but that's a million specimens. Um, and we, we don't yet have the time or resources. It's just me um, on, uh, on, on our current funding yet to do, to do all of that. So we had to choose a subset and um, the butterflies are a popular group with the public. And we have only about 15,000 to 20,000 specimens. So they're a good starting point. I should actually say the, the UK dragonflies and damselflies um, have been digitized as well. And their label information has been recorded. I, I helped do that on a previous project as well. I'm not quite sure why, but our, our dragonfly and damselfly collections are a lot smaller than our, our Lepidoptera. Um, but uh, that has also been catalogued too. But yeah, for this project, it's the butterflies we're looking at. The second name, as I said, is then to use the stories stored in these museum collections, including those stories of long-term change in wildlife and wildlife declines to engage the public and wider audience with, with what has been lost, but also with places they can still see wildlife around them today. So some of the insects in the stores are nearly 200 years old. They're collected by famous naturalists of the day and they show us what used to live in the area and they're powerful aids to engage uh, with the public. And I'll share some stories with you in a moment uh, of how these stories of the naturalists of the past are interesting in themselves as well. Thirdly, as I mentioned, uh, we want to support modern day wildlife conservation. So we will do this by providing long term data sets from museum specimens from before modern recordings began in the 1970s. About, about then, that's when a lot of the modern um, butterfly recordings started. And this will provide more data on species declines to give, a, to give conservation organisations more of an idea of how how much things have been lost um, beyond living memory. Um, we also though have a chance to, to garner public support for the work that these organization, conservation organizations are doing. So I know that Henry's talked about the Great Fen today and that's exactly the kind of project we want to infuse people with, showing them specimens of the past that used to live in these fenland habitats. Uh, I don't have time to go into the whole project today. So I wanted to do is, um, I wanted to focus on the insect collections of one uh, historical naturalist uh, who has material in the Zoology Museum in Cambridge and use this as an example uh, for how these historical figures and stories of the past can be used to engage the public and uh, use this information to provide modern data for conservation efforts as well. I think Henry may have briefly mentioned uh, who I'm going to be talking about. And this is the individual I was going to mentioned. So this is uh, a naturalist called Leonard Jennings and I hadn't actually heard of him before studying him a few years ago so don't worry if you haven't but it's a shame more people don't know about him as he was on the fringes of one of the biggest developments in natural science of the last 200 years and has particular importance to Cambridge and the, and the Zoology Museum here as well. So as you can see here he was a uh, born in 1800 and lived to 93 so it's a very good age especially in those days and um, his family home was Bosham Hall just north of Cambridge and his father uh, was vicar of Swaffham Prior uh, just nearby. I've actually been to Bosham Hall where his uh, descendant still lives today it's, it's a really cool place um, and because his father was a vicar it meant it was a it was a very religious upbringing but Jennings also had an interest uh, in the natural world fostered from an early age I believe his uncle had quite, or maybe his uh, godparent, had quite an extensive library and would send him books on natural history. So Jennings had that interest in natural world fostered and he carried that with him through his studies. So first he went to Eton, and then he went to St John's College, Cambridge um, in 1818 uh, to follow his father's footsteps and actually to study to, to join the clergy. And it was here that Jennings met other notable naturalists of the day. So his 
Mentor and friend was John Stevens Henslow. So he was professor of botany at Cambridge at that time. He did lectures and led excursions into nature. And Henslow is probably most famous for also being the mentor of Charles Darwin. Um, and Jennings and Darwin met each other at Cambridge when uh, several years later, Darwin joined uh, Christ College in Cambridge. So you might think that Jennings and Darwin would become firm friends. They both have a passion for wildlife um, and the natural world, and they have this shared mentor. But actually, that wasn't quite the case, possibly because they were both vying for the approval of Henslow. So actually, they started off their relationship by having uh, a bit of a rivalry. And uh, I really like this letter. This is quite an early letter from, from Darwin to his cousin. It says, um, you will see my name in Stephen's latest number. I'm glad of it if it is merely to spite Mr. Jennings. So this is a funny side of Darwin we maybe don't think about, but he basically says, I'm glad my work's been published, even if it's just to kind of rub it in Jennings' face. Um, so yeah, we think of Darwin as this amazing theorist, but you know, he's, he's human too. And early on in his career, he was vying for the attention of, of other people. However, this, this, was a, this was not to be the way that they, their relationship continued. So um, this rivalry ended and they did become firm friends. So here we have a, another quote from Darwin. He says, at first I disliked Jennings from his somewhat grim and sarcastic expression. And it is not often that a first impression is lost, but I was completely mistaken and found him very kind hearted, pleasant and with a good stock of humor. So uh, there we go, they've, uh, they've become friends. And um, this is good because that meant they were both in Cambridge at the same time with Henslow, who was leading the charge for kind of natural history uh, in that era. And it meant that they could share the love of natural history and go out looking at wildlife and collecting specimens together. And this is indeed what they did. They both had a love of beetles. And here we have a beetle from the Zoology Museum collection. I think it's a, called a Black Night Runner beetle. And um, its data labels are shown alongside it from its pin. And they show that it was collected by C. Darwin. So you see the first label near Cambridge, C. Darwin, so Charles Darwin collected it. And it, then it found its way into Jennings collection, X collection L Jennings. So this means they did used to go out collecting together and appear to have exchanged beetles as well. So it's a bit like playing cards back in the day. If someone had five beetles of one kind, but they wanted one that you had and they didn't, they might trade it and that sort of thing. Uh, I should note as well, these, these aren't particularly helpful notes from Darwin near Cambridge could be pretty much anywhere um, and you would hope as well that there would be a date alongside that but um, but there you go these are the kind of labels that he, he used to make. Um, and Darwin was uh, very well known in fact for his love of beetle collecting and uh, one of my favourite stories of his comes from a letter he actually sent to Jennings about beetle collecting. Um, you may well have heard this before but I, I really like it so I'll, I'll retell it. Um, so Darwin had basically already been out collecting beetles for a little while. And he had caught a beetle in each hand, at which point he saw this species, uh, which is a crucifix ground beetle. So it's very rare today, but still pretty rare in Darwin's time. But his hands were full and he, he loved beetles so much he couldn't bear to let go of either of the beetles in his hands. So what was he to do? Well, he says what he did in the letter to Jennings. And he says that in despair, I gently seized one of the carabi between my teeth, when to my unspeakable disgust and pain, the little inconsiderate beast squirted his acid down my throat and I lost all the beetles. So what we think happened here is that one of these first two was probably a bombardier beetle. And it's got this anti-predator defense where it does emit that kind of foul tasting fluid. And um, I like the story because, you know, here we have Darwin, this famous naturalist. And at this point in his, uh, in his life, he was, you know, putting beetles in his mouth. Uh, so there's hope for everyone, but it's a, it's a fun story to see a different side of him. If we fast forward a few years to 1831, this is when um, Captain Robert uh, Fitzroy is on the search for a naturalist um, and companion to uh, accompany him on HMS Beagle around the world on a voyage of discovery. Because Henslow and Jennings are both senior, to, to Darwin and being in Cambridge longer, they were actually suggested and offered this role before Darwin. However, for various reasons, so I think uh, Henslow had actually just married Jennings' sister and had a young family, so he couldn't really leave. Um, Jennings had just started to become a vicar himself and he couldn't, uh, he also had a wife who was quite sickly, so he couldn't leave her for long periods of time. They both had to turn it down and they both suggested Darwin for the replacement. 
so again, I just find that really interesting, that this, this kind of landmark appointment where we associate Darwin with this Beagle voyage very nearly didn't happen. And it's because these two gentlemen suggested him that, uh, that it did. This is a quote from Jennings as well. Um, I quite like the, the kind of side of him that shows. He says later when he was asked to reflect on not going on the Beagle voyage, he says he regretted his unimagin unimaginative decision, but that no better man than Darwin could have been chosen, which I think is quite nice. Um, so potentially if Jennings had gone on the voyage, he wouldn't have noticed anything that, that Darwin had. And remember, he was a member of the clergy, so potentially the ideas being put forward by Darwin would have been tricky for him to um, grapple with. So that's kind of like the famous bit of the story. So instead of going to the Galapagos, though, and traveling the world on the Beagle voyage, what did Jennings do? Well, I, I find this amazing as well. He actually never once went abroad. So after being offered a, a, a chance to travel the world, he only ever stayed in this country. And he lived in Cambridgeshire for around 30 years and he followed in his father's footsteps, as I mentioned, and he became vicar of nearby Swaffham Bulbeck. And he seemed very content. Um, this gave him lots of free time in the countryside, pursuing his passion, collecting specimens and uh, making wildlife recordings. And he did this for about yeah, 30 years. And the material he collected was then eventually donated to Cambridge University in 1865. And part, that forms part of the original nucleus of our collections at the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge, which has since been added to. So clearly he's, he's a very important figure for the museum as he provided some of the very first specimens that we had. You can see an image here uh, of the kind of old museum galleries and what they used to look like closer to when the museum first opened, so long before the redevelopment uh, and our shiny new display cases we now have, but very impressive uh, nonetheless. And here is a draw of Jennings specimens is Hymenoptera, so bees and wasps mainly, um, still all stored in the museum today. So we have that in, I know that is in the insect store. Um, and each one provides a little piece of historical data. But something probably even more important than the pinned specimens uh, that Jennings donated to us are his notebooks. So Jennings took it upon himself to record notes on every single species he and his friends saw in Cambridgeshire almost 200 years ago. So he's got four beautifully handwritten volumes now stored in the uh, Zoology Museum. Um, three are called Entomologia cantabrigiensis, so the insects of Cambridgeshire, and there's also one on vertebrates. And this is a page here from uh, one of the ones on insects, and it's open at the page for the swallowtail butterfly. Of course, he will have missed some things, but because he lived in Cambridgeshire and recorded for nearly 30 years, his notes form a near comprehensive list of what lived in the county 200 years ago. And this is rare, as many collectors only really focused on species they are particularly interested in, or maybe collected specimens from selected holiday locations they like to visit. Um, it's rare to have a long time frame of trying to record everything in one location. And we can compare Jennings' notes with what we see in Cambridgeshire today and see how much things have changed. And this is the idea behind uh, the recording change in the past for this project. And yeah, his notes record the story of decline, but also some, some uh, stories of new species coming in as well that we want to uh, use to engage the public with. So again, let's have a look at some butterfly examples. Um, we have the swallowtail butterfly on top and then the, the large cough butterfly at the bottom. And we have the notes that Jennings has from his notebook, uh, which he wrote in about 1820 to 1849. Um, we can see that for the swallowtail butterfly, he said, found in the greatest plenty throughout the fens between Ely and Cambridgeshire. And for the large copper, he says, not uncommon in Cambridgeshire. Well, these are really quite striking statements as the swallowtail butterfly uh, is completely extinct in the county now. It can only be found in the, the wetlands of, of Norfolk. And the large copper butterfly um, has actually been extinct for some time in the entire country. It's still in, in Europe, but the, the British subpopulation is completely extinct. Showing the public an extinct species from the local area alongside records saying that it used to be abundant is one of the clearest ways to get across that large changes have taken place with local wildlife. So museum collections help us shift baselines back in time so that we get this historical, uh, these historical losses people are not, not maybe aware of. And once we've established that things have changed, you can then begin to ask why and engage people with what can be done about it. Well, 
these two species are wetland specialists. So, uh, and I don't want to talk too much about this because Henry again has talked to you about this already. Um, but this map um, shows the former extent of wet fenlands in Southeast England, so the blue outline. And it's thought that over the last 500 years, this habitat has been progressively drained to make space for farmlands. So that's about 99% of this habitat has now, has now disappeared. And no habitat means that the species that it supports have also dwindled and disappeared as well. But obviously some wetlands did survive and local conservation organizations are working to maintain and expand them. So we've already talked about the Great Fen project, which is in, in red there. Um, it looks like a drop in the ocean, but is a really large extensive site and is doing a great job at hopefully re-wetting this landscape so that some of these species can be supported again in the future. And again, this is the kind of work we're trying to publicize, not all doom and gloom, but that we have lost things, but there's a huge amount that is going on at the moment to support wildlife that everyone can get involved with as well. And also just places people can visit to continue to interact with, with nature. So in addition to sharing these extremely important stories of decline and conservation with the public, uh, trying to tell the stories of the famous naturalists from history can then add another layer of interest to engage people with. So people may not think much of a single pinned beetle, but if you tell people that uh, this beetle was collected by Darwin, then suddenly people do perk up. And we do have Darwin's beetle collection on display in the Zoology Museum normally in the galleries as well. So that was more of a sort of general overview of um, how museum collections can provide historical data. So what I want to do now is move on to talk about a specific example of research um, at the Zoology Museum on the butterfly species, which has been supported by this project. Um, to do this, I'm going to talk about the work of a different researcher in the Insect Ecology Research Group. Uh, her name's Beth Wallace, who completed her MPhil with us last year. And she had three main questions she wanted to answer using, using our butterfly collections. So how has the abundance and distribution of butterfly species changed at the time? Are these changes linked to habitat specialisms? And how have museum biases impacted the results? Which is also an important question. To do this, she did a pretty mammoth job um, extracting label data from the University Museum of Zoology Cambridge butterfly specimens. So she was reading the labels and writing uh, the date and location of capture down and also who collected them. And in the span of only a few months, she extracted information from over 4,000 butterfly specimens. As I say, this is actually, this is a tricky feat. These are somewhat, sometimes 200 year old, very fragile butterflies. Um, so you gotta be very careful as you do it. She collected this from 41 species with representatives from each of the butterfly families found in the UK. And to add to her data, she then downloaded uh, label data from the same species from the Natural History Museum's online collection, which actually they've got a huge collection. They've got over 50,000. Um, actually, they've got far more than that, but she, she downloaded data from an extra 50,000 uh, specimens. And she could then compare these records with modern recordings from butterfly conservation. And then on top of this, um, I mentioned before that the historic literature and the notebooks are perhaps even more important than the specimens themselves for analyzing change over time. So Beth also compared historical literature, including Jennings notes, um, but also books on the national distribution from, from uh, the 1800s uh, with modern recordings as well. And uh, we can have a look at, at what, she, what she found. Well, at the national level, uh, 57 of the species she studied had declined in distribution. So when comparing historical records with modern observations over time, only four species had increased. A, um, a more complex pattern was seen if you only look at the county level data from Cambridgeshire, as some species can come in and colonize from other counties whilst others are lost. But overall, uh, declines were still larger than increases. And actually in Cambridgeshire itself, up to a third of the butterfly species that have historical recordings or are in the historical literature, up to a third of them are, are no longer found in the county. So definitely, unsurprisingly, it's a, it's a story of decline. The other key finding um, that Beth found is that specialists appear to have suffered worse declines over historical time frame than generalists uh, and, and migrant species as well. And that um, museum collection bias is detectable. So what I mean here is that certain species and locations are favored in particular collections, which makes sense. As I, I mentioned before, some collectors like to go out and collect specific species 
or go to specific sites to collect them. And if you think about it, this could mask true patterns of how abundant species uh, really were in the past if some species were collected lots, even though they were rare and that sort of thing. However, there are ways for us to identify and deal with these biases so that they do not cloud the real world patterns. And there's a PhD student working with the Natural History Museum specimens in London who's actually researching how to do this. And um, if you are aware of them and if you study them as Beth did, um, you can actually see what these regional biases are and they allow you to build up an idea of the regional specialisms that different museum collections give us. So smaller museums such as the one in Cambridge uh, have obviously some wet Fenland Cambridgeshire specialist collections, um, whereas Natural History Museum of London has a more of a wide scope of the, of the country. Um, Beth in her normal talk goes into a lot more detail, I don't have time today, but I'm happy to answer questions on how she went about trying to, trying to solve out these biases um, in the question and answer session later. So conclusions from what Beth um, was studying is that museums and historic literature provide evidence to extend modern recorded declines back in time, at least another 150 years. And they show us a more biodiverse original baseline that used to exist. Beth, Beth highlights um, this phrase from, from Jennings notebooks when he describes Cambridgeshire as a county which through drainage and enclosure has lost of late, uh, of late years so many of its rarer species. So this, you know, this was a pre-1850 statement. Um, so, and Beth has now shown how much has been lost since. So, you know, clearly, I mean, I think we know this intuitively, but this loss of biodiversity is something that's been going on for a long time. And this um, emphasizes the important work that is going on with habitat restoration projects, such as those being done by the Wildlife Trust of the Great Fen to support uh, lost and declining species. And then finally, to wrap up, because this is obviously the British Dragonfly Society, I wanted to give some examples of uh, Jennings specimens and notes on dragonflies. Um, so I found a few. Uh, um, so we've got the uh, the um, banded damoiselle here. Um, and we can see that it has been common as it is today for, for some time. So Jennings simply notes common in watery places and so kind of unsurprising. Similarly, is another common and widespread species here. Jennings shows us, again, has been around for a long time in large numbers, plentiful in the fens uh, about Cambridge and Ely for the four spotted chaser. Whereas others, I'm not quite as up to date on my dragonfly data as I am my butterflies, but Jennings entry for the common hawker um, suggests there might've been some change since his day. So it says less common than his previous entry. So the previous entry did just read common. Um, so it was not seen much in his day, but I, I think this may now have been completely absent for Cambridge for some time. But either way, if I'm wrong there, you can see how these uh, historical recordings can be used to see if there's been a lot, a lot of change with modern records. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing about my work and the Zoology Museum collection. It's a really varied project that I'm involved with at the moment. And uh, I want to say a huge thank you to all the Zoology Museum staff, all of my research group, including Andrew Bladen, um, Wildlife Trust staff and volunteers, and Esme Fairbairn, my funder, um, who have done so much to, to help me with my work in this project over the last few years. So thanks very much. <laughs>